2014 Financial Results Q&A Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will be at that time. I would like to turn the call over to your host, Mr. Jeff Evanson. Please go ahead. Thank you, Patrick, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Tesla's fourth quarter Q&A webcast. I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Tesla Chairman and CEO, J.B. Strabo, our CTO, and Deepak Ahuja, Tesla's CFO. We announced our financial and operational results today in a shareholder letter that's available at the same link as this webcast, and a replay of this webcast will be available later today at the same link. The shareholder letter includes GAAP and non-GAAP financial results, as well as reconciliations between the two. Our non-GAAP measures add back deferred revenue and related expenses for cars delivered where the cash has been or will soon be collected. These non-GAAP results also exclude stock-based comp, compensation, and non-cash interest expense. Revenues and costs associated with cars leased directly through us are treated the same in our GAAP and non-GAAP financial information. Now, during our call, we will, be ma we will be discussing our business outlook and making other forward-looking statements, which are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent 10Q filed with the SEC. And now, Patrick, if we could uh, assemble the queue and have our first question, please. If you have a question, please press star then one. Our first question comes from Andrea James with Doherty & Company. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for um, taking my questions and congratulations on the rocket launch. Um, so just quickly, can you help me get to a free cash flow figure? It looks like you're going to do $1.5 in CapEx, but um, what's going to be the operating cash flow to offset that? Yeah, we will have um, clearly significant uh, – Deepak here. Uh, hi, Andrea. Hi. We will have significant uh, – positive um, operating cash flow, obviously, as our business uh, our volume grows and our gross margin uh, continues to improve. Uh, we'll also have some cash used on our direct leasing program. Um, our expectation is that we will establish uh, shortly a warehouse line for uh, leasing cars, and that will continue to grow and fund a big portion um, of our um, uh, leasing uh, funding required. So. Um, you know, overall, we feel pretty comfortable where we are in terms of um, how 2015 looks from a cash flow perspective. So maybe about a billion, is that about in line, cash burn? should be less than that, okay. uh, considering that we will have um, a lease a house line, which continues to expand. Got it. And so then another point. Um, it looks like you expanded your residual value guarantee into extra markets um, late last year. And then I saw last week you're giving um, free charging, home charging to folks in China. So I guess my question is, it looks like you have really pretty good demand. Global wait times are increasing. So why, why continue to give incentives to buy the car if demand is so high? Sorry, incentives? Uh, well, I think uh, fundamentally in China, we want to make sure we are not creating any hurdles or issues that create a negative customer experience. And um, charging installation, given the varied uh, regulations and challenges there, has been a difficult customer experience, and we want to overcome that by providing it directly. <clears throat> yeah, but this is also something that's considered standard in China. So if you like buy an i3 or a Leaf or something, that it, that it's considered a standard thing, so we're just matching comp what competitors do. Um, but I mean, there's like a whole, this, this whole sort of China thing has been blown way out of proportion. Um, the, you know, we, we, we didn't execute super well on China last year, but it didn't, it didn't really matter. I think, the, I think people don't quite get that, like it's not like there were all these extra cars we could have produced, um, and if only we'd had a bunch more customers in China, we could have sent you know, those cars. We had, uh, we were production constrained, so I wish we weren't, but we were. Um, so look forward to getting to getting demand constrained in the future. So the, I mean, essentially, it, did, it didn't matter whether we, you know, to the company as a whole, whether we sold 
a lot of cars in China or a small number of cars in China, we would simply have had to steal volume that would have had, had it otherwise headed to the U.S. or Europe and send it to China. So it, it wasn't a high priority for the company um, because it wasn't, it wasn't a constraining factor. Um, now, obviously, in the long term, uh, we, we do want to succeed in China and, and make sure we're doing a good job. Um, and I think just like the rest of the world, China wants, um, wants to have the best products, and we, we think the Model S is the best car in the world, and that's indicated by a multiple outside assessments. Pretty sure that people in China want the best car in the world. So, um, you know, so that, that's, that's something we, we, we've got to make sure we, we lay the right foundation for for, for, for future growth. Um, but it was essentially irrelevant to last year. Um, that's, 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 an, that's an important point. The, uh, and and, and the, um, the, the, the biggest issue, which we're still fighting to address, is this perception that it is difficult to charge your car in China. This is false. It is not difficult to charge your car in China. Unfortunately, this, this sounds kind of brain dead, but our sales team was telling people that it was difficult to charge in China, even though this is not true. Like, that is, that's pretty silly. Um, and so the, the, I, I put the guy who was in charge of the supercharger rollout in China, who was doing an awesome job, and an engineer, basically, he's not a salesperson, um, in charge of China uh, to make sure that charging is super easy and excellent. Um, there's not a marketing guy or a sales guy. He's like, he's an engineer. And, uh, and he's an operations guy, and he's going to just make sure that people have, that customers are trying to have a fantastic experience. Um, and then, just like in other countries, those customers become our sales force, and, and the product sales grow by word of mouth. So is this a company philosophy? Because it seems like you, you're putting engineers in charge of customer service, even globally with Jerome. I mean, is customer service an engineering problem? Uh, well, see, I think if you've got people that are good at creative problem solving, then they will they will be good at creative problem solving. I think uh, I, I tend to view, I guess, it's my own bias, but most things, since I'm an engineer, I kind of view things as an engineering problem. But you know, not everything is an engineering problem. But uh, yeah, I think it's like you've got to design a system, and sometimes those systems are in the form of a, mm -hmm. of a car, or, or it's a charging thing, or it's a way that you communicate with, with prospective customers. Um, it's just creative problem solving. So if you have, so what you're really looking for at, at, a, at a high level is, is a creative problem solver uh, who just cares about getting it right. And so that, that's what we're, we're doing. Um, yeah, and I'm confident that uh, certainly by the end of this year that we'll be in in really good shape uh, in China, um, and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Uh, I, I don't think there's some sort of unique m missing issue in, in China. And if you look at, say, our sales in Hong Kong, our sales in Hong Kong are excellent, um, uh, but we don't have that uh, uh, misperception of, of charging issue in, in Hong Kong. Um, and everybody lives in the apartment buildings there as well, so it's not like it's super easy to get uh, local charging. Um, so I'm confident that uh, just as we've, uh, we have seen high demand in every other part of the world, that we'll see it in, in uh, China as well. And, and just to the point that, thank you for the clarity on China, just to my point on the residual value guarantee, is that something that you plan on keeping and why keep it? And what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a good question. I've actually debated, like, should we keep it or shouldn't we keep it? Because it's kind of moot. Uh, the, the residual value guarantee is um, it sort of matches what other premium sedans uh, see uh, after kind of a three-year time period. But our actual residual values are substantially above that, so it never actually matters. So we're, we're not like paying out residual value guarantees because the car is worth more than the residual value. Uh, and it does it does kind of mess up our accounting because. Uh, we have to treat it like a pseudo lease. Um, that, that's, that's, on the other hand, if we withdrew it, then does that mean, would that people take that as a, a lack of confidence in our product? I think that they might. They might misconstrue it as such. So 
So even though it's moot and it doesn't really matter, it's just there to provide confidence to customers. Uh, yeah, so I think we'll probably keep it, even though it, it, it makes our financials look worse than they really are. In fact, I, I think it is really important because uh, we do get some criticism about uh, their gap versus non-gap, uh, as, though, as though like you know when we do non-gap, we're actually like trying to trick people into thinking something's better than it is. But ac actually, it's not true. I, I I don't I think that the way the accounting rules currently work don't give a correct picture. We're trying to give a more correct picture with non-gap, not a less correct picture. Um, and the, the, the difference between, and as, you, and as you can see from our gross margin, gap and non-gap are basically the same. Um, so, so when we, for revenue, the difference between non gap and non-gap is just that if this, it comes down to just two things, this residual value guarantee, um, where, where we, as we just talked about, it's moot. Um, but, but because it's a pseudo lease, we have to recognize the revenue over time, even though we got the cash immediately. Um, so our, our sort of two, our cash flow is with non-gap is an accurate representative of our, representation of our cash flow, which is like what really really matters. Um, and uh, yeah, so and then, and then even even in non-gap, we don't for for leases that we do internally, they actually aren't even covered in non-gap. You know, in receipts, the full cash up front, so it's aligned with our cash flow. Exactly. Okay. Exactly, it's lined with cash flow. Right. Whereas in some other auto companies, um, the moment they sell the car to a dealership, we understand they recognize full revenue. I think mean, the financing entity might lease that car, and so they don't have the cash flows, but they have a gap revenue. So in some sense, our non-gap revenue is pretty clean, and it lines up well with our cash flows. Yeah, this is really important, because a really important point to emphasize, because like, our, you know, criticism might be, are we, are we perhaps um, exaggerating our revenues relative to how other car companies might represent the revenues. And what Deepak just said is a very good point. What the other car companies will do is they will sell the cars to the dealer groups, but then they will then turn around and, and lease finance those same cars. So they're sending it through the laundromat is basically what they're doing. Um, uh, the, in our case, since we are not sending it through the laundromat, it's, much, it's actually more correct. <laughs> um, the, because you know, if we do a lease, it, it's all internal, and we're not trying to sort of send it through some third party where actually the risk is still assumed by the, the parent car company. Um, so, yeah. And, and then even for leases that we do ourselves, um, we can securitize those leases whenever we want. So we can, we can take those leases, bundle them, put them into, um, you know, a securitization program or... Uh, just get a warehouse loan to uh, recover the capital. Um, the, the reason we're, we're using our existing capital is is just basically common sense because we've got a big bank balance that's earning like 0.1 percent or basically nothing, actually minus whatever the in inflation rate is. Um, and so it makes more sense for us to put that capital to work uh, with consumer leases and earn, you know, two to three percent. That's basically what it amounts to. Uh, but at, at, at any, whenever we want to recover that capital, we can do so through warehouse level securitization. Um, yeah. Thank you for taking my questions. So, so this is, yeah. So our financials are better than they appear, not worse. <laughs> this is really the key point. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian Johnson with Barclays. Your line is open. Yes, good, <clears throat> good evening. I um, want to explore a bit um, where you see the trajectory of CapEx and OpEx. You gave some guidance for next year, but as we kind of think ahead to the Gigafactory and as we think ahead to the model, excuse me, the Gen 3 launch, how do you see those trends uh, going over the next several years? Um, we're going to spend staggering amounts of money on CapEx. <laughs> I mean, for a good reason and with a, good, a great ROI, um, you know, and, and it's important to, to not look at the CapEx in isolation because like that CapEx obviously is being done for a reason in order to capture a substantial future revenue flow. Um, but um, I mean, I was just saying the sort of back of the envelope, um, you know, just 
if, if you assume, if you make certain assumptions, and I, I emphasize these are just you know, certain assumptions. Um, I'm not saying they're true or that they, they will occur, but I'd, I'd bet that they do occur, personally. Uh, so that's just my personal opinion. I mean, if you take uh, this year's revenue, you know, around $6 billion or thereabouts, uh, and if we're able to maintain a 50% growth rate for 10 years and, and achieve a 10% profitability number and have a 20 PE, our, mac, our, our market cap would be basically the same as Apple's is today. Now that's going to require a bit, so, you know, on the order of $700 billion. Uh, obviously, getting there will require some significant capex. Um, but I'm hopeful that we can do this without, without any significant dilution to the company. So maybe minor dilution, but nothing serious. And how about in terms of operating expense? And do you have a target for reported margins versus kind of thinking about your remarks in the second press conference that you kind of where margins would be if you stopped growing? Is there, is there a difference between the margins on a non-GAAP basis we'd actually see versus what they would be if you weren't making those kind of investments? But you mean profit margin as opposed to gross margin? Yeah, yeah, the operating margin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we could easily get to 10, 10 to 15 percent. I mean, probably if we push, if we, if we so somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Because, I mean, we're talking about gross margin that's, that this year will probably, you know, by the end of the year, be somewhere around 30 uh, percent. So then if, if 20 of those points go to, you know, a, a sort of fixed costs and R&D and whatnot, and then you know, there's at least 10 left over for profitability. Um, and, and we are expecting it to be non-GAAP profitable. Right? Oh, and we have been non-GAAP profitable yeah. for two years now, 2013 and 14. Yes, and I'd like to emphasize that doesn't mean bullshit profitable. It means really profitable. <laughs> yeah. It's difficult to parse um, your question, Brian, in terms of separating OPEX between a fast-growing company like Tesla versus Steady State. Clearly, we want to invest in the future, but we want to do it efficiently. And we are going to focus on being efficient with our OPEX fundamentally uh, this year. We are. That, that is a key, key thing. The, the simple math of, of headcount requires this. I mean, we're, we're basically a little over 10,000 people, and, uh, you know, aiming for somewhere over 50, 55,000 cars this year. Um, just to get to half a million uh, cars a year, if we do not improve our productivity for person, uh, we would need, you know, 100, sort of called 100,000 people. I'm not sure we would where they would park. <laughs> so clearly there needs to be dramatic improvements in productivity, which are underway. Right. And so when you said 10%, was that 10% while still growing to the millions of cars target you talked about in 2025, or that's kind of 10% when you get to that millions of cars target? Um yeah, I think at a certain point we'll actually be able to maintain 10% profitability despite nutty growth because you just run out of ways to spend money. It's kind of like, kind of like Apple. They're like just running out of ways to spend money. They spend money like it's water over there, and they still can't spend enough of it. Yeah, and I think for us we are a single vehicle platform company at this point, so our engineering expenses have their ebbs and flows. So that has an impact. But as we grow, we become a portfolio of uh, vehicle platforms. Um, even with nutty growth, we can get to uh, a very good operating margin. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's sort of pointing out, like, we're, we're doing this, <clears throat> and it's mentioned in the letter, but th there's massive infrastructure expansion going on, like, tr really massive, like, um, setting up service centers worldwide, setting up, it, it creating a ubiquitous supercharger network worldwide, um, just, you know, logistics across all these countries, uh, going with customs and the unique elements of each country, um, you know, we're, we're massively increasing the, the sort of scope and scale of, of Tesla um, in order to, to lay a foundation for future growth. Okay, great. And just final question more for Deepak. Um, 
when does CapEx flow into um, depreciation and gross margin? What kind of time frames for the CapEx in terms of depreciate, depreciable um, lifespans are you assuming on things like Gigafactory, factory drilling, and so forth? Yeah, so to answer your first question, when assets are put to use for production um, and delivery of cars, that's when depreciation kicks off. So a lot of our spend this year is on production capacity expansion and Model X ruling. Those assets will start depreciating when Model X um, starts producing. The Gigafactory assets clearly would go into uh, would be depreciated when we start producing cells that are being used for um, for production and, uh, and our revenue um, growth. Um, and, and the life of uh, the depreciation life depends on the kind of asset. It can vary from five years for tooling to longer if it's equipment, and if it's facility, then it could be 15 to 30 years. Uh, we follow the generally accepted principles there and our expected life. Um, of use to come up with those issues. <clears throat> okay, great. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Adam Jonas with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Uh, evening, everybody. Uh, first, back to China. Uh, do you have any concerns about your ability to pursue business in China? on terms that protect your interests. Uh, what I mean is, like, you know, if you look at the German manufacturers, they don't seem to have any problem with 50-50 JV structures or well, with local partners and not having control and selling through franchises. Are, are you able to uh, – is, is, are those terms that you're comfortable doing business with in China? Um, well, I, I think we're, we're definitely going to want to have uh, local manufacturing – Probably some amount of local R&D as well uh, in the future in China. It's not going to make a ton of sense in the long term to be building a huge number of cars in California and shipping them to China. Um, but you know, r r right now we're still at the early stages, so it's difficult to say exactly what happens in the future. I mean, our, our goals in, in the short term in China are just very straightforward, which is just to build out our uh, service and supercharger infrastructure. Um, and just get the basic uh, foundational elements there. Um, well, we're not going to dealers uh, as we don't go. In, you know, not, we don't go to dealers anywhere in the world. Um, so our activities in, in China are currently 100% Tesla owned, um, and you know, it sort of depends on what the evolving landscape is in China in the long term as to whether you know, and how a JV would have to be set up. Okay, uh, Elon, just on, on the patents. It's been eight months since you opened up the patents to competitors to use. Um, any takers of any significant technology? Uh, I'm not aware of any. Are you surprised there hasn't been more? And is it just a function of just um, kind of is it is it hubris and pride, uh, your competitors, or is it they just don't have the <clears throat> kind of intellectual capabilities or software engineering depth to um, to kind of contextualize what you have to offer? Um, I'm I'm quite sure that there will be, and, and that that uh, that that actually manufacturers are. Uh, currently planning to use our, our patents, but it's just important to remember the design cycle. From the point at which you can use intellectual property, you got to sort of incorporate it into the design. That design has got to get, you know, you've got to do detailed engineering and design, you've got to tool, tool things up, and then you've got to go to production. So the first, it's probably the first time you see companies, any, anyone using our, our IP would be about three years after we announced. Okay. Uh, and, and finally, Elon, just, you know, you, you mentioned, I think, you said staggering amounts or obscene amounts of, of money on CapEx. Companies that usually have those kinds of, say, spending ambitions at this uh, point in the um, uh, growth phase also have uh, pretty developed relationships with capital markets to help fund that growth, and you yourself uh, and your enterprise has been, um, I think, done that quite, quite successfully. Any heuristics you can kind of leave us with as people kind of contemplate more cash burn with the, you know, being necessary to fund great things and great projects that will ultimately pay off. Uh, but any, any kind of rules of thumb of minimum levels of liquidity or the kind of things you'd look at um, to, to decide uh, whether you'd need to, to kind of um, uh, refill, the, refill the capital tank. Thanks. That's it. Uh, we, we don't have any plans for you know, raising money um, right now. So the – and, and I, I think we can we – can, um, Get to that, that sort of crazy level that I described earlier, with with really minimal dilution. Um, you know, it's really going to be very much 
the, the overwhelming, amount, overwhelming amount of it would come from operating cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, feel feel generally pretty good about about it. Um, but you know, getting getting to that level uh, with with uh, you know only moderate minor to moderate pollution. Um, you know, I think the only reason we raise money really is, and I'm not saying we, we, we really don't have any plans to raise money, but the only reason I can imagine we would do it really is just to have a, a bigger cash cushion. That would be the, you know, in case there's a big uh, downturn in the economy or something like that. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Lavallo with Bank of America. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks for taking the call. Um, first question is: I mean, cash burn continues to be, you know, pretty pretty uh, aggressive here. So the question is: if demand is as strong as you guys are saying, and really is the issues on the supply side, why wouldn't you raise prices, you know, in all regions to at least set, you know, offset the FX headwinds? And, and the reason I'm asking that is: if, if you have more demand you can, than you can handle, this won't hurt deliveries. Uh, it should also, you know, clearly benefit cash flow and investors, and will also support the residual values for your, for your current owners. So it sounds like a win-win all around. So can you just address that, please? Well, I, I mean, I actually kind of think our car is is, is expensive as it is. Um, it's really not a cheap car. I mean, for a huge number of our customers, it's the most expensive car they've ever bought. And I didn't think they'd ever buy a car that costs $100,000. Um, so I, I'm reluctant to, to raise that, that price. Um, and and it's just, as, as we start running into sort of fundamentally afford, fundamental affordability limits. Um, and um, I mean, as it is, we're, you know, we, we are expecting to be significantly you have to have significant positive cash flow uh, in kind of the latter half of the year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there'll be sort of a short-term dip, but it's, uh, you know, we're going to be quite positive at the end of the year and, and then going into 2016 even more so. And I think that's uh, completely linked to uh, a major product launch, especially in the automotive industry. You have to invest in the CapEx for manufacturing capacity, and then the cash flow comes through when you launch yeah. But just to be clear on that, when you say you're going to be cash flow positive by the end of the year, that's after CapEx? That's our, yeah, that is our expectation. Um, and I think we've got to have focus on the long term, right? This is a short-term issue in terms of timing of CapEx versus revenue. But, yeah, but to answer your question, uh, yes, even in the face of significant CapEx, we expect to be cash flow positive in Q4. In Q, in Q4, okay. Um, I, I mean, it'll happen somewhere in late Q3, you know, but it's, it'll be reflected most clearly in Q4. And it's linked with the volume production of Model X. Yeah, exactly. We better get Model X because um, we have a ton of capex related to Model X. Exactly. Um, and and we've also um, invested in a bunch of things that actually um, are, are volume numbers that are really better associated with Model Three. Um, so that our quarter billion dollar paint shop upgrade is intended to be able to handle 10,000 cars a week. Okay, thanks. And then the next question is, um, there's been a lot of discussions about persistent drivetrain issues. I mean, we've heard everything from, you know, from different customers from you know, persistent humming noises to complete failures. So the question is, I mean, how pervasive is the drivetrain issue? Um, what is the cost to replace a drivetrain? And you know, I was a little surprised to see that the warranty reserves would not uh, move up quarter over quarter. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of noise on the forums uh, that, that it, it's it's not quite as bad as people may. It's certainly, I mean, for, for most people, they don't experience any drive train issue at all. Um, the, uh, th th there was a period of time, um, like basically for like a, a month or two, um, about a year ago, uh, where um, I mean, this is kind of getting into the weeds, but the application of grease on the spline of the, the motor was incorrect. Um, and that caused the, the, the spline to wear out and strip the spline on the, on the, on the drive unit, on the motor. Um, so uh, that, and that particularly affected sports. And unfortunately, it happened to coincide with a, when a whole batch of, of cars headed for Norway. So unfortunately, it just 
disproportionately affected uh, Norwegian customers, which we've taken great pain to try to address. Um, but essentially, what it, amount, what, what it amounts to fix that issue, for example, is just to you've got to you've got to pull, pull the drive unit and then send it to get uh, remanufactured, where we replace the the rotor uh, and uh, and you know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and maybe to the warrant. This is JB. To the warranty reserve question. You know, we've actually, you know, incre improved quite a lot in our efficiency at repairing the drive unit. So, you know, it, it might be swapped for a given customer, but that unit doesn't get trashed. It gets repaired. And, you know, the the elements that that need to get repaired are increasingly narrow, and we're, we're yeah. really targeting them quite directly. Even the rotor can be repaired at this point. Yeah, um, and there was there was a differential clunk that was causing a differential clunk, which can actually be fixed with a, um, a two-pot shim uh, in the service center. So we were able to figure out a service center fix to address that um, without even dropping the drive units. All the new units being built today, of course, get all these fixes, you know, uh, proactively. So yeah. you know, as we learn, the, the new product improves. That's, that's helpful. And, and finally, uh, Elon, I just wanted to ask you about your comment about gap profitability not being reached until 2020. And I, I know you guys say that the non-gap way is the way to think about it, and, and I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that here. But what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that if there's not going to be gap profitability until 2020, and we kind of walk down from a, the streets, you know, consensus non-gap number to a gap number by, you know, adding back stock comp, adding back, you know, uh, non, non-cash interest expense and making an assumption on, on the leasing, my estimates would suggest that street estimates are 30 to 60 percent too high because the gap component of that non-gap number would need to be eliminated. So if you guys could just help me think about if that math is incorrect and uh, more importantly, what is the, the path to profitability for, for Tesla? Sure. Um, I think people read too much into that in my comment because I, I was asked, when, when, do you, when do I think Tesla will have full year gap profitability? Um, and you know, so that, that then you get into the sort of residual value guarantee question, like do we, do we continue doing that or do we, do we not continue doing that? Because ha like half of cars are financed, right? So that basically chops our revenue in half in, 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 in a lot of cases, you know. So and leasing as well. And then leasing. So if, if like leasing and, and residual value guarantee are half the cars, that would basically massively affect um, the revenue recognition. Um, so. Uh, and, and then is, is it just on a you know a quarter basis or is it a full year? Um, so I think like um, I mean it's, that, that, that's why I said okay well probably 2020 it's the full year and it's gap. Um, that's uh, but but I like w w what that actually means is that like Tesla's like pre cash flow is incredible in 2020. Is able to overwhelm even the the non-GAAP stuff. So, I think people didn't understand that what I said was an extremely optimistic, not pessimistic statement. <laughs> okay, thank you, guys. Our next question comes from Ben Callow with Robert W. Baird. The line is open. Hey, thanks for taking my question. Uh, a couple different ones. The first, uh, kind of a lower level one. As far as the X goes and timing, could you just talk about, I know you, re you reiterated deliveries in Q3 and just your confidence level around that. And then maybe, you know, one of the questions we get a lot is if we extend that to the Gen 3 and, you know, your 2017 time frame, can you just talk about right. the work you're doing there and, and how, you know, confident you are in getting to that timeline? Yeah, that's fair criticism. Um, implied criticism. The, the uh, I mean, the, the I mean, it does feel a bit like the Venus paradox here. Like, you know, we're sort of halfway there at any given point. Um, but uh, I mean, really, at this the the X design is done. So it's just a question of of tooling and supply chain at this point, uh, and um, and then making sure as we do the ramp up on X that our quality is excellent. You know, it doesn't it doesn't do any good to. Uh, obviously, we don't. We, don't we, we want to make sure people have a really great experience. We don't want to have them, you know, have have any sort of issues or problems. So, um, 
But, but I mean, it's really, at this point, like I said, it's just tooling and supply chain. So, and we're trying to make that go as fast as possible. Um, so we're hi highly confident of delivering our first customer cars this summer. Um, and then spooling up to significant volume in the in Q4. Uh, now, with respect to Model Three, um, you know, we, we definitely we, we don't want the, the delays that affect, that affect you know the the X to affect the Model Three, and we're really taking you know we've been quite conscientious about this. Um, and I mean, there are, there are things that we could do with the Model Three platform that are really adventurous, but would put the, the, the schedule at risk. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to going to have something that it's going to be an amazing car, but it, it won't be the most adventurous version version of the Model Three to begin with. But we will then have the more sort of uh, well, the the, the more kind of different uh, version of the Model Three on the Model 3 platform following the initial version so that we can stay on track for Model 3. Um, we got, you know, we're quite adventurous with the X, um, and we don't want, we don't want to be, uh, that, that would be too risky given the, 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 the Gigafactory and everything sort of has to, has to happen on time. We don't, it's, it's, we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to go super crazy with the design of the, of the initial version of the 3. Um, so I, I, you know, I do feel confident that um, we, we can make that happen in the second half of 2017, uh, Great. As, long as, as long as we stick to those principles. Um, Great. Yeah. And, and, and a que question on uh, innovation and, and releasing new new features. Um, you know, what, what did you learn from the dual motor as far as the timing of new releases and how that impacts demand and how, how you do that going forward? I know you guys are constantly innovating on the car, um, but does that disrupt demand at all, and, and how do you do that um, it, that you don't specifically do in model years, you know, big, big advances? You know, this is a problem that we struggle with. It's really tricky because uh, we, we're – we basically have one car, you know, with variations. Uh, this would be much easier if we had different cars. Um, and you know, so we, we, it's tough for us to announce uh, way in advance that there's going to be some new version of the car because then we're, like, worried about starting near-term sales um, while people wait to see what it is. So it's a real tricky thing. Um, and, and then we also, it's difficult to forecast the exact demand. Since we haven't told people about the car, we have to kind of, we really have to guess. Like, okay, how many people want the P85D? Uh, we have no idea. Um, it turns out a lot, okay? It turns out a really, really a lot. So then, then it was like, uh-oh, we, we have uh, too much demand for the P85D. Um, and uh, and now, now we're going to figure out how to do that. And then, like, how many people are going to pick the next gen seats? As it turns out, also a lot. <laughs> so we couldn't we couldn't make enough seats. Um, so I mean, I'd love to figure out how to be less stupid about this in the future. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I think one thing in, in particular that uh, you know we're working toward is to to be sure that we're really ready to meet the production demand at a much higher percentage mix as yeah. we announce something new or an innovative new feature and. You know, that's definitely, I think, a lesson we learned. Yeah, agreed. Great. And, and my last one is on, on the storage side of the business. Can you just talk about any developments there? I, I, we've heard some utilities looking for RFPs for utility-scale projects. Are you guys at a position where you can start uh, bidding on those RFPs or entering those RFPs? And just give us an update there. And thanks, guys. You're for stationary storage? Yes, yeah, stationary storage. Yeah, yeah so for... Like basically giant factory packs, I and mean, we're we're betting on a lot of RFPs already. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that, Um I, I don't want to go into a super amount of detail on this, but um, you're correct. Of course, there's a lot of interest and a lot of uh, utilities out working in the space, and we're talking to almost all of them. Um, you know, it, it's it's early stage stuff, and a lot of these projects are very far out since the you know procurement cycle for utilities is so long. Um, but but this is a, a business that's certainly you know gaining an increasing amount of our attention. 
Yeah, <clears throat> but um, we're going to do, I think, a, a really, we're going to unveil the, the, the so the, the, the Tesla home battery or sort of, um, consumer battery that would that would be for use in in, a, in people's houses or, or businesses fairly soon. We have the design done, um, and uh, you know, it, it should start going into production probably in about six months or so. Um, the we're, we're trying to figure out a date to have the sort of the, the product unveiling, um, but it's, it's probably in the next month or two. It's, it's, really, it's really great. I'm really excited about it. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from Ryan Brinkman with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, can you give us a sense for what you think your gross margin would have been in the quarter if not for the 1,400 deliveries that were pushed into one queue? Well, I, I, actually, the, maybe better way to say it is like, I mean, there were, there were like a bunch of things that coincided um, uh, you know, because we, we had expedite, a whole bunch of expedited shipping. Because um, even to make those numbers, we had massive overtime, massive expedited shipping, um, and then the you know the euro was also falling. And uh, you know, if, if those things hadn't occurred, I mean, we'd uh, you know, be somewhere in the order of 28 percent. Um, maybe, maybe yeah, so somewhere around there. Okay. Um, that's that's helpful. And then uh, just last question will be quick. Uh, you know, is there any additional color you can give us on just the, the cadence of sales and production throughout 2015 beyond one? You know, I, I'm, I'm curious uh, why the deliveries are expected to be flat in 1Q versus 4Q, given that they should benefit from the push-out of those holiday deliveries, and, and why production is forecast down sequentially, too, given that the full year has got it up so much. And sort of beyond 1Q, what can you tell us in terms of when you expect the implied inflection to occur in 2Q or 3Q, what the catalyst is for that, whether it's a capacity bump up again or Model X or something like that. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and just to clarify, sorry, about the estimated 20%, that's, that's 20% excluding Zev credits. So if you added Zev credits on top of that, it would be, I don't know, 29 or 30% or something like that. So, um, the, yeah, if, in, in terms of the production from Q4 to Q1 being relatively flat, there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, there are actually two fewer weeks of production in Q1 versus Q4. Uh, one, one is because we had to give, you know, we, we wanted to, and, 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 and certainly so, gave people the, the first week of January off because they've been working over Christmas and New Year's and you know, Thanksgiving in a lot of cases. So they're just, just to you know, give people a break, we, um, we, we didn't operate the factory in the first week of January. Um, and, and also give us time to do some equipment upgrades. And, and, then, and then there's also one, one fewer production week in Q1. So it's, so it's basically minus two weeks. Um, uh, and, and then in, in Q1, we're, we are focused on productivity improvement um, and laying the groundwork for um, higher volume in the remainder of the year. Um, but obviously, if you do the math, it, 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 is, it does mean there's going to be a fairly big scale up as you get towards the end of the year. And we had over 10,000 orders on hand, so it's not a demand issue to be delivering and the guidance number. We have a lot of cars in transit as we are, uh, again, uh, adjusting our global mix of uh, deliveries. Okay, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of cars in transit. It's kind of crazy. Thank you. Our next question comes from Patrick Marshall with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Oh, thank you. Yeah, good evening. I, um, you know, just wanted to follow up actually just on, on some of the comments you made about being less adventurous for the X uh, relative, for the uh, Model 3, excuse me, relative to the X and playing it a, a, a little bit safer. You know, can you just give us a, a sense of, you know, what, what, what some of these characteristics and features are that um, you might have at one point been considering for um, the, uh, the, the the initial you know version that maybe you know put in place uh, for a later model upgrade. Uh, we, I mean we can't we can't tell you that. I mean come on. So, um, but, but yeah, there's just you know with, with the X we had the, the Falcon wing door, you know which is the, the first sort of um, double actuating gull wing door basically, or we call a Falcon wing door. Um, 
get, getting that right and making sure it works really well and isn't, isn't a gimmick, but is a fundamental improvement in utility and aesthetics for the car is extremely difficult. <laughs> um, there's a reason other people haven't done this. Um, the, and then, and, and then the, the second row on the Model X is, like, it is a, the second row of the seats on the Model S are a, a piece of sculptural beauty. They're amazing. <laughs> They're the nicest second row seats you've ever seen in any car ever. Um, that actually might have been harder than the door. Um, and there are some other things about the X that people don't know about yet. Um, uh, but those, those weren't the driving schedule, which were the second row seats and, um, and, and the, the door. Uh, so then going to Model 3, we want to, you know, I think we, we want to have, uh, particularly at super high volume, something that, that, that you know, that, that, that for this feature, we, we lose a year of production. You know, that, that, that would, it would make more sense to just go with something that we know people are going to love. That's going to be incredibly beautiful and functional and an amazing car. Um, and, and then, and then innovate uh, in more, um, I don't know, avant-garde directions on that platform with future iterations where we're not, we can then put aside um, any schedule and, and volume con uh, consent. Uh, un understood. Um, uh, certainly looking forward to seeing the X. What, have you guys said when, is there going to be any sort of advanced, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, showing of it, you know, at any auto shows or anything, you know, some of the more advanced prototype of, uh, ahead of the launch um, that we should be looking forward to? Um, you know, because there are these sort of different features that I mentioned uh, being sort of intentionally obtuse, we're not going to show it until, it's, until, until it gets delivered. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, just switching gears a little bit back on China, um, uh, just on orders. Now, I understand that, you know, deliveries have been significantly impacted by a number of the issues that you've, you've described, but, um, you know, how have orders been trending in China, you know, especially now that you've made some replacements, you know, on the management side, you seem to have, you know, uh, a, a solution well in hand that's being implemented to address some of the concerns, whether they were justified or not. Um, you know, how have you seen, um, you know, kind of the Model S uh, order book track, you know, pre and, 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 and sort of post those issues? Well, I mean, Tom's only been in charge for a short period of time, but um, I, I, the trend is positive already. So I, I think um, we, we see it improving every week. Uh, and, and there's some, like, elementary things that we were missing before, like maps and directions. <laughs> so the car didn't, didn't have maps and directions in China, which is kind of important. So now it, ha now it does. Um, and, uh, you know, we're... We don't have like the onboard music player working, which we will have soon. Um, so there's a lot of functionality that's that's just getting added as, over the over the air software upgrades that are you know, pretty helpful. Um, so yeah, the the trend is is positive. Um, I, I don't I don't have any significant concerns about it right now. I mean, it, it had been some had reported that orders had been coming in, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, a hundred a day. Um, and, you know, which I'd obviously point to a pretty good um, annual run rate. And, and, you know, is that sort of at least the order of magnitude that you were trending at and that you can get back to in the shorter term? The, the problem last year was that we had a, a whole bunch of speculators um, that, that, that are based on time to, to buy large numbers of the cars and then resell them at a higher price, which is not something we allow. Um, so that it, it gave like a an inflated sense of, of demand in the beginning. Um, so it, it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't real. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't think we were at hundred a day at any time. Yeah. Either. I mean that would sound like fifty thousand plus cars just in China alone demand at any annualized rate. I, I don't know what the source is. Okay, no, that's helpful, color though. Um, you know, last one for me is just, you know, a, more of an accounting clarification. Um, 
You know, I think in, in one of the pages you talk about direct leasing um, impacting, um, I guess, reducing, sorry, both non-GAAP and, and GAAP profitability. Uh, I think we understand why it, you know, reduces GAAP profitability. Um, you know, we, we've actually addressed that a lot in this call. But non-GAAP, I, I was just wondering why that would impact, be impacted. Yeah, uh, because we still hold title to, to the car, and we haven't collected full cash on the car. And so we don't recognize uh, those direct lease cars, even in our non-GAAP financial. Pretty simple. Understood. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, but, but as I mentioned, that, that we, we, can, we can always free up that cash by uh, securitizing our, our internal leases and, or, you know, or, or by just warehouse, getting a warehouse loan facility. So, so, so yeah, the, the, the important point is like that our, our, you know, I guess what I would consider our real revenue is actually higher than our non-GAAP revenue because of the internal leases. Got it. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, guys. And, and I mean, if the vehicles delivered to customers is really the key, the key metric that I focus on. Um, we don't give people a car unless they pay for it. <laughs> they pay for it somehow. And the average price for a car is pretty obvious. So that, that's really the key number. Right, thank you. Right. Next question comes from Rod Lash with Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. Hi, everybody. Um, I apologize if this has been um, answered. I had some phone problems here, but I was hoping you might be able to help us with what you see as the run rate of sales for Model S right now and that bridge to the 55,000. You know, sh should we look at the 40,000 deliveries or may maybe it's 46,000 if you annualized what you did and add in the delayed Model D? Is, is that a run rate? And then you know, to get from here, um, to 55, um, wh where is China now? What does it need to be? And, and what actually are you including for the uh, the Model X this year? Uh, yes. Yeah, so so I, I should correct. Even if our sales in China were zero this year, zero, um, I'm still confident we could do the 55,000 cars. Um, there won't be zero. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, as far as what the mix is between S and X, it's, it's really tricky. I, I wish I could tell you with accuracy, but it really depends on how the production ramp goes with the X um, when we start up the summer. Um, and even small changes uh, in that ramp can have quite a dramatic effect on, on X production. So Especially for the calendar year because it's late. Exactly. Long term makes no difference. Yeah, exactly. And you could be like, you know, if, 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 if we're if we're producing, I would say, 800 exes a week, um, you know, and uh, you know, but if, if, if several weeks is like several thousand cars. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just really it's really tricky to predict it from. I mean, if, if like, if we, I can much easier predict like next year. <laughs> Um, you know, assuming people like the car, uh, you know, that, that, that's where you start to see, you know, I don't know, 40,000, 30, 40,000 at least, mm -hmm. 50,000, I don't know, but cool, 30 to 50,000 excess next year. Okay. Um, and, you know, clearly, you know, up until now, as you pointed out, you've been able to, you know, hit all these numbers without any advertising and, and marketing. Um, and, 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 and no endorsements and no discounts. <laughs> right. To, to get... So we, we, haven't paid, we haven't paid anyone to pretend that they like our car. Right. This is a and, very, and, very important and point. No franchise dealers and, you know, all these things that you know, people had said that yeah. you might need to do, you, you've been able to do it without any of them. But I, I'm just yeah, curious yeah. about kind of longer term to get to the volume objectives that you are looking for this year and beyond, um, is are all of those in your view achievable? Um, you know, of, while avoiding the franchise dealer model, while holding back on advertising and marketing, and while you know, in, in some cases, even raising prices, for example, in Europe to adjust for currency, are, are, are any of those impediments to the demand um, 
objectives that you have, and, and would you uh, modify the strategy in any way uh, to achieve these volume numbers? I think I think we're okay, going to be okay on on the demand side for for this year. Um, I mean, th maybe something changes next year, but I think we'll be okay. I don't, I don't think we're going to have to do a bunch of advertising or uh, throw in the towel with the dealers or anything like that uh, this year. Um, and um, you know, we'll discount the cars or anything like that. So. Um, in fact, I do want to emphasize that you know, whenever you see like a celebrity or, or some prominent person uh, driving a car, they all paid full retail. Uh, there, was, there was no discount. We can give them a car. They're buying a car and they're driving because they really believe in the car, not because someone paid them to pretend that they do. Um, so I'm going to give them you know, credit for you know, the, the people that have, have bought the car. Um, so yeah. Um, I mean, there's. I, I, I think we. I, I do have sort of um, secret weapon on the demand side that probably start to deploy later this year um, for demand generation, and we'll you know we'll see how that goes. Uh, it isn't it isn't totally necessary, but I think I think it could be pretty, could be pretty interesting and a good a good a good. Uh, Weapon against the dealers. Okay, um, and uh, just one last question I had. Um, you mentioned in your um, your letter that the margin was pressured half by revenue and half by cost factors. Um, the the FX part of this was pretty clear. But there was a comment in there about deferred autopilot revenue. C can you just explain, maybe just elaborate a little bit on, um, you know, what you meant actually um, in that description of of the the margin variance. On that particular one, um, Rod, um, we announced um, several features that the autopilot functionality or hardware will deliver. Those features, um, um, although the hardware is in the car, um, some of them will get activated through software releases later this year. Uh, and so based on the business uh, <coughs> aspect of revenue um, for accounting, we had to defer some of that revenue. Mm -hmm. into 2015, um, and um, I, I think it's as simple as that. Okay. Yeah. And th that variance was versus the 28% um, original objective, or is that versus, um, you know, what, what was that comparison against? That that was uh, yeah. It's part of that because as you know, we, we had to figure out the accounting for it, work through the whole thing, and it. Uh, uh, as we deferred, you know, a significant amount there, uh, that had an impact to our otherwise delivered car gross margin that would have been. There. I mean, it's like on the order of half a percent or yeah. something like that. You know, that's right. Maybe half to point seven percent or something. Yeah. Um, and um, but but the the most of that deferral will be taken care of this quarter with the software release next month, uh, which will add a bunch more functionality to the car. Um, in fact, I'm really excited about the software release we have planned for next month. It's um, a bunch of features in it that are going to positively affect the entire fleet, um, and uh, and then of course we'll we'll add more and more uh, autopilot uh, capability. Uh, that should be exciting. Yeah, it's going to be really really a good release. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Before we go to the next uh, question, I want to do a time check with you, Elon. We're coming up on the hour mark. We have several more questioners in the queue. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Okay. All right, Patrick. Five thirty, Corvus campus. Our next question comes from Dan Gal with Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Hey, uh, thanks. Good evening. Um, I just had a question on the um, the delivery guidance. You know, if you adjust that for you know, in additional in-transit vehicles. Uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of whether you feel like that's your best guess on kind of your max production for 2015. Um, you know, because my sense, you know, coming into the year around 1,000 a week is you could produce a lot more than that. Um, so I'm just getting a sense of, uh, you know, what part of that is demand constrained and what part is production constrained. Uh, well, 
I mean, we're all going to try to do a little better than the 55 number. Um, so you know, we're saying 55 plus, but we are going to try to do a little better than that. Uh, but it is, as I mentioned earlier, just really dependent on how the X ramp goes. Um, that that can have quite a if it happens you know, later in yeah, it's kind of how long it takes to spool up that that could affect the the delivered number quite significantly. Also, like when you say delivered, it's like you, you've got to. Also, factor in that there's a lot of cars on ships. Correct. There's uh, a gap between production and delivery times. Yeah. And then, you know, we need to consider there could be disruption during launch of X. And so, when you're looking at that broad number of 55,000 over the year, still, there are things we need to consider through the year what happens. Yeah, so 55 is like a number that we're, we're pretty comfortable uh, with achieving uh, on deliveries. And um, yeah. Um, and, and we are, as we're showing, making a conscious decision to focus on productivity this quarter, uh, not just on, just not, not not just on ramping production. Uh, but but like, stability. Yeah, just production stability. Yeah, once production stability. You know, in order to get get that efficiency, like we need to be building a firm foundation for future growth. And if we're just in, you know, a helter skelter, you know. Uh, Production ramp, trying just trying to grow production numbers is really hard to get the productivity and, and, and kind of fix the, the foundational elements. Um, so the conscious decision this quarter to to say, okay, we've got we've got to we've got to um, improve our, our core productivity. I mean, we're running out of parking spaces, like literally. So <laughs> our Fremont plant is pretty big and it's hard to park. So uh, we, we need to, we need to just get these productivity. In place so we can grow our production volume without proportionately growing headcount. Yeah, that, that uh, makes that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then just one kind of housekeeping question: and the you, know, you put the chart at the beginning of the the shareholder letter with a you know a revenue guidance for 2015. Is, is there anything in there for trade-in sales for used car sales? And and do you have any sort of sense of kind of what? Type of drag on gross margin, um, uh, you know, sale of trade-ins will be. There is a small amount of that. You know, we are just getting into that business um, <coughs> now, and our goal is certainly not to make that same kind of money uh, on our used cars. Um, yeah, but the used cars also it's like the capital. We don't have any capital in there really. We yeah. have turn around capital at all. Yeah. So it's actually like the used car. Um, the yeah, margin is, is, is actually it's, it's on our ROI basis it's extremely good. Right. Okay. I mean, the dealers do make a lot more gross margin on used cars than new cars, and that's not our intention, but the ROI is still really good for us. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to separate that out so you can see new car gross margin um, versus you know, used car service and other things. Right, which brings up a good point that, um, as we said at the, at the end of our shareholder letter, uh, starting for 2015 financials, we're going to uh, show our income statements slightly differently. Their automotive uh, revenues and cost of goods sold is truly new car sales, and then we have services and other section of the income statement that has all these other things, including trade-ins. And yeah, so we'll, we'll break it out so you can right. see clearly like what, what's the new model is. First margin, what's you know, used, what's other things, yeah. Yeah, it's very appreciated. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Dan. Our next question comes from Trip Chowdhury with Global Equity Research. Your line is open. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, we see a lot of similarity between Apple and Tesla. Both cars, both companies go for perfection, performance, and design. But we don't see Apple making a $30 iPhone. I was just wondering, instead of focusing on Model 3, and we just focus on, say, Model S and Model X, but make them even better, and just focus on increasing the range to, say, 400 miles, 450 miles, you already have uh, the Roadster, which is at 400 miles now. I think that well, would make this not quite 400 miles, but yeah. <laughs> The roads are sort of more like 360, but so, you know, close to 400 miles. Yeah, um, so with the upgrade, uh, capable of doing LA, uh, San Francisco, but, but yeah. Um, so yeah, but to 
I mean, the, the goal of Tesla from the beginning has always been to, um, to accelerate the advent of sustainable transport, and it seems to make electric cars happen much faster than would otherwise be the case. So in order to do that, we have to make lots of cars, and we need to make them at, uh, a heck of a lot more affordable than the S and the X are today. Um, you know, even with the, the Model 3, though, I mean, it is sort of a mass market premium car. It's not a, it's, it's not sort of, it's, ma it's still premium, but it's mass market premium. And it's, it's that 35K. It's not a, you know, it's, it's by, by average car. Yeah, I think it's also not an either or decision. You know, we, we definitely will keep making the S and X better and, you know, we'll keep improving that platform really as much as the technology will allow. So. Um, you know, we'll go in both those directions. Perfect. Thank you. Our next question comes from Andrew Fung with CLSA. Your line is open. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so the Gigafactory seems to be making some good progress in terms of the construction. Could you provide an update on how the development of the battery supply chain is progressing and, and perhaps, you know, any notable challenges or, or perhaps uh, positive surprises um, that have occurred with that, with that uh, process? Um, sure, I can, I can take that one. This is JB. Uh, you know, so far we've been pretty pleased with the supply chain developments. You know, we're spending a lot of time visiting um, more and more of the, of the supply chain partners and, you know, understanding and, and learning about all those different markets. Um, you know, that, that learning is progressing quickly, and, and uh, I think we're getting a much more clear picture of exactly, you know, how we will achieve, you know, the cost reductions we've talked about. Um, you know, I don't want to go into too many specifics on exactly, you know, sort of what we've learned in which places, but I'd say, there is, you know, a lot, maybe more incremental positivity on some of the, the commodities and uh, you know, some of the ways that I think we can secure and, and procure pricing on some of the, the larger commodity prices that go into the cell. Great. And any sense of, um, you know, when you guys may announce additional either suppliers or partners for the Gigafactory? Um, we we want to be a little bit cautious about doing that too soon. You know, there's obviously a lot of work going on in, in discussion with all of those partners, but um, I think we, we just we, we want to be careful to make sure that uh, you know all the agreements and, and decision on the you know where that partnership is headed is uh, is very clear. Uh, so you know we'll we'll wait until it's uh, it, it's really done and, and ready to announce. Great, thank you. Next question comes from Andrea James with Doherty and Company. Your line is open. Thanks for taking my follow-ups. Um, why did you guys promise the Roadster 3.0 this year? Uh, it's just a long, a long-standing obligation we have. I mean, it's not something that economically is, you know, a win for us, but it's it's just an obligation to uh, our you know, early adopters of Tesla. Uh, you know, we, we said we'd. we'd uh, provide a significant upgrade to the roadster, and that's what we're doing. Um, and, um, yeah. yeah, I think it's it's okay. I mean, it's not a, it's not a big thing one way or the other. Uh, it's sli slightly economically disadvantageous to Tesla. And, and so if I, if I read through on the range um, communication on the Roadster 3.0 and I just apply that sort of same range gain to the Model S, um, I, get, I guess I get a 350 to 400 mile mile range Model S by, say, 2017. Is that the right, I mean, is that kind of, is all the, the gains there translatable? Uh, it, it's, it's difficult to, to put an exact time on it. If, if you, if, like 2017, probably not in 2017, at some point, yes. Um, I don't know if that was 2017, so it's not 2017, but it might be Say 2019 or 20 or something like that. But, but it's, it's more than very much like we, we can we can make the Model S go 400 miles a day if we wanted to by just increasing the pack size. So right, I meant at the same I meant as the same cost, uh, same pack cost. Say give it $22,000 pack would be 400 mile range in the next couple of years, but that seems it's a bit too aggressive. Next couple of years would be too aggressive. If you go five years out, that might be the case. 
I'm not, that's not a prediction. That's just that's speculation. But it, I'd say it's not two years, but it might be five years. Okay, and then just I feel like we should just generally ask you your thoughts on oil, although it's a pretty broad question. So maybe just general thoughts on oil, but then more pointedly, um, what it does to the residual value of the cars, and then also maybe the corresponding offset with lifting the value of the ZEV credits as more gas guzzling cars are sold. I don't know. Um, there you go. Uh, well, as far as oil is concerned, I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on oil business, um, but, but obviously fracking has massively increased the available oil reserves worldwide. Um, fracking is also more expensive than, you know, than, than standard oil drill drilling, so that there's sort of a, a cost of doing it that sets the floor on, on fracking. Um, but, man, it's, it's really anyone's guess as to what happens with oil prices long term. Uh, demand is certainly going to increase, sort of like how, to, how well does supply go to match that. Um, for, for sure, uh, oil companies are going to be scaling back their investments in new uh, oil fields massively with, with the low price of oil today. So expect uh, that I would, I would expect that it's. Uh, but as it translates to the the impact on demand for your vehicles, um, and then also the residual value of those vehicles. It, it certainly has some effect, but it's, I wouldn't say it's. It, it's not. It's not a. It's not. It's not a dramatic effect. I mean, it's. I call it a, a moderate effect. Um, and, and I'm not. It's not changing any of my. Projections. Look that way. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. This ends our Q and A session today. I'll turn it back to management for closing remarks. Well, thank you everyone for joining us a few hours later. Obviously, that was important to get the launch off, and uh, so thank you and good night. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for participating in today's program. This concludes the program. You may all disconnect.